Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Daily Grey Refuel, where I recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today is the 19th of February 2021. Alright everyone, let's get into it for today. So, I think I, I kind of need to discuss this uh, on the Refuel today before I jump into all the updates uh, from, I guess, the last 24 hours. And, you know, there was a lot of drama, I guess, over the last 24 hours about Binance Smart Chain and, you know, Ethereum and Ethereum competitors in general and stuff like that. So I wanted to talk about that. And I got pretty fired up on Twitter. I mean, you know, I, I personally, I really just don't like the kind of like misleading marketing going on, but I'm going to get into that. But I do want to kind of start off by saying that crypto runs on narratives, right? So what, what you see across the entire kind of crypto space is like a story being sold from every project out there, right? Ethereum's trying to sell a story, Bitcoin's trying to sell a story, all the projects within there are trying to sell stories. And that's how you get people on board with your mission, right? Get people excited about your product, get people buying your token and stuff like that. So that's something to keep in mind while I talk about the rest of the stuff I wanted to talk about today. Um, because it's very important, right? You, you see this play out across everything, always. It's just always the narrative, the story. You know, if you have like a really great story, then you can get a lot of users and get a lot of people buying your token or get a lot of people paying attention to your project. Uh, and that's exactly what's happened uh, here. And I'll explain why. So firstly, I wanted to start by saying, I don't blame anyone for using other things other than Ethereum, right? I don't consider myself an Ethereum maximalist. The reason I spend so much time in the Ethereum ecosystem and, and work so hard on Ethereum, work so hard to educate people and support Ethereum is because it has the values that I want to see upheld with this technology. Those being decentralization, permissionlessness, and censorship resistance with uh, you know a smart contract pla contracting platform built in. You know, Bitcoin has those kind of um, properties as well, but you can't build anything on it, right? I mean, you can, but it's very limited, right? So that's why I kind of like spend most of my time in the Ethereum ecosystem. And then within that, I like to support projects that stick to those ideals as well, right? Because for me, especially with decentralization, if you're just building a centralized thing, then you can just build it on a dat database and it's better. You don't need to build a centralized blockchain to achieve that goal, right? So the only reason you do that is because you have a token attached to the blockchain that you want to kind of like sell, right? And that's part of the narrative weaving as well. So, you know, I understand that people are using other things because the fees on Ethereum are high. Totally get that. I mean, I don't like paying the fees either. Like, I'll be honest. I mean, it is annoying when I go to Uniswap and I pop up and, you know, there's a MetaMask pop up and it says $50. I'm like, ugh, right, this sucks. Um, but, you know, I, I guess I'm a bit more tolerable of it because of the fact that, like, I'm so involved with the ecosystem. You know, I know what's coming down the pipeline. I try to use the layer two solutions when I can, but the ecosystem still needs to be kind of built out there. So totally understand if, you know, I mean, most users can't afford these fees and they just want to do simple things like a, a, a trade or whatever. And if there's an alternative out there offering you cheaper fees, but, you know, you, you, you kind of like don't really care if it's not decentralized or whatever, that's fine. Like I totally, totally don't really have an, have an issue with that. But I think, you know, in the long term, Ethereum and decentralization is still going to win uh, for various reasons. But I think, you know, there's also this, this concept of like, and, and I guess this isn't supposed to be about Binance Smart Chain in particular, but it's supposed to be about, I guess, like centralization versus decentralization. But I want to focus on, on BSC, Binance Smart Chain, because that's what everyone's talking about right now, right? So, you know, people say to me, oh, you know, poor people can't use Ethereum or people with not much money can't use Ethereum. And I, I agree, that's fine. But at the same time, the only things you really do, you're doing on Binance Smart Chain is playing in the casino, right? I mean, Ethereum has a casino as well with DeFi. Don't get me wrong. You know, not all of DeFi is like super organic bank the unbanked or unbank the banked activity, right? Where it's, um, you know, not casino-like activity. But, you know, I, I on, on Binance Smart Chain, it's pretty much all that, right? It's just all like massive speculation. Now, poor people are not doing this, right? They don't have the money to do this in the first place. So on that note, I just don't see that, right? Um, you know, if they want to go there and they actually just want to do trades of certain things and get involved with the technology, that's fine. But if people are literally like, and I'm, I'm using the, the kind of word poor literally here, like if you're in poverty, if you're living paycheck to paycheck sort of thing, or even less than that, then I don't think you're going to be putting your money into crypto, right? Um, I, I mean, I just don't see why you would, right? Why would you blow your money in a casino when you, you need to kind of like buy food or whatever, right? So, or maybe, maybe I'm wrong there. I don't know. But I, the way I see it is that the people that are using kind of Binance Smart Chain right now 
are the people who are just chasing the money, right? Chasing the casino. And those people, you know, are coming from Ethereum most of the time too. And, you know, yeah, yes, they may not be able to afford the fees on Ethereum. Um, but the thing is though, if there was no casino on Binance Smart Chain, they wouldn't be using it, I, I don't think, right? There's just money falling from the sky. So I think that's a big reason because if Ethereum had low fees and there was still money to be made on, on BSC, then people would still go there. Like, I, I just don't think that the fees are the major driver here. They are a driver and they're playing to the narrative that Binance is trying to sell here. But I don't think that they're the main reason because without the money, without the carrot and the stick, right? Without the incentives, people wouldn't really have much reason to move over. So I, I think that's kind of like the main thing there. Um, my main issue with BSC is the misleading marketing. I actually don't care that it's centralized and it's, it's doing whatever and they're like doing incentives to get people to come across and giving people money. I don't care about any of that, right? What I care about is even like the CEO CZ saying that it's decentralized, saying that apps on there are flipping Uniswap in in volumes when, you know, it it's very obvious that a lot of the volume is faked because on a low fee chain, you can actually fake the volumes very easily. And if you control the whole chain, you're paying yourself the fees anyway. So, you know, it, I, from, from what I can tell, most of the volume is faked, right? And that's just to juice up the narrative again, right? If you can say, oh, PancakeSwap flipped Uniswap in volume by faking the volume, then you can sell a narrative and pump the BNB token, which it actually has been, right? It's been working and the other tokens too. So as I said at the start, all, all narrative, right? And you see how this keeps playing into it every single time. Everything that is, is kind of being marketed is to sell that narrative. And I, and I should know I came from marketing, right? I was a full-time marketing person at set for 18 months and I still do marketing stuff. So I know how the game is played and, you know, I, to Binance's credit, they're very good at this. Um, but at the same time, they're, they're misleading people. So that's what I got really upset about today. Not so much about people using BSC or, or thinking that it's like a threat to Ethereum. I don't care about that, right? And I get that like a lot of users don't think about decentralization as the first property that they're looking for when using this kind of technology. But for me, it's like, okay, well then what's the point, right? Just build something centralized and let people play in that um, and, and tell them that it's centralized. Don't lie to them. Like I just, I hate the lies, right? And the misleading marketing here. So that's, that's kind of my problem there. And then I see some people saying, oh yeah, okay, you know, BSC is centralized. It can decentralize over time. It's like, no, that, that, that's, not, that's not what can happen. BSC is a straight clone of Ethereum, right? Straight up clone, literally to the point where they didn't even bother to change some variable names. So it just says Ethereum in their code, right? And that's fine. It's all open source. You can fork it. But what they did was they forked Ethereum. They cloned it. They removed proof of work mining. They put what's called delegated proof of stake in and they have 21 nodes that are running the entire network. Now these 21 nodes are all owned by Binance. Like that's that's not even like, a, I don't even think they try to hide that fact. Um, it's all owned by Binance. So essentially it's just a Binance kind of centralized chain. Now, what they did to achieve scalability, right? Because you might be wondering, oh, if they just cloned Ethereum, then how did they achieve scalability? Well, with these 21 super nodes, right, as, they, as they're called, they don't have to worry about things like state bloat and, and blockchain size and whatever, right? They just, they take the cost of that on themselves because they're making a lot of money from the price of BNB going up and other kind of things they're doing on the chain. So... They basically increased the gas limit. Um, you might have heard me talk about the gas limit before and how that is a bottleneck for scalability on Ethereum. It's currently set to 12 and a half million on Ethereum. I think on Binance Smart Chain, they jacked it up to like 50 or 60 million and they can keep pushing that up, right? If they if, if they hit those ceilings. So that's why the fees are low because they haven't hit that ceiling yet. I think they're at 40% network capacity, whereas Ethereum's obviously at 100 plus percent, right? At all times at this time. So that's what they've done there, right? And that's how they've been able to to kind of like get the fees down. But at the same time, they're still using the underlying Ethereum technology, which has its own quirks. It has its own limits. There's only so far you can push it before you start running into a lot of these issues. Now, cost is a, is a big thing, but obviously Binance can bear the cost because they're, they've got billions of dollars. So that might not be an issue for them. But the issue is on the tech level. So when they start running into these kind of uh, Ethereum specific kind of tech problems and bottlenecks, because they've just forked it and they don't actually understand how it works, they're not gonna be able to fix it. So from that point of view, they're not, they're not even gonna be able to decentralize because for, in order for them to decentralize, they need to just introduce everything that they took out to achieve that scale anyway. So they need to introduce either uh, Ethereum's proof of stake or proof of work back into it. They need to cap the gas limit, right? They need to lower that. And then they need to basically ha have a healthy fee market going for to, to support the network and pay validators as well out of like block rewards. So, 
it, they're never going to decentralize. I'm just going to like put that out there. It's always going to be centralized, but that doesn't mean that they can't succeed, right? They can, of course, succeed and they can, of course, get users because they have lots of marketing money and, they, and they're, they're not shy about just like saying whatever they need to, to get people to come across. So th there's, there's that kind of aspect to it. Um, for me, I think that, again, I said it before, the battle is not really BSC versus Ethereum at the end of the day. It's centralization versus decentralization because it's very easy to create centralized platforms. But the reason why Ethereum exists is to decentralize all of those functions. The reason why DeFi exists is to decentralize those functions. It is not to just replace the existing kind of, I guess, banking cartel that we have today with a new cartel that are quote unquote crypto native, right? That's not what I'm here for. And I'm sure a lot of you aren't here for as well. So, you know, if we're just settling for that, then I'm out, right? <laughs> if we're just going to settle for centralized kind of chains where it's just like casinos and no one cares, then I, 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 I'm out personally. Like, I, that's not what I'm here for. And I'm glad that there are a lot of people in the ecosystem here for those ideals and sticking kind of with it. And that's why I will stick with it. But, you know, if, if everyone kind of gives up, then that just makes me lose hope. Like, and that's why I said today on Twitter, it's like, you need to keep fighting for this sort of stuff. You need to fight for decentralization because the people who, who want centralization, they can move faster. They will, you know, lie about it. They will be able to scale easier by making sacrifices, right? And it's just going to be harder for people who want the decentralized world to take off to kind of get it there. And it's going to take a longer time. Ethereum's taking the long and hard path towards scalability. Uh, and, and because of that, we're kind of like being punished in the short term because we haven't fixed the fee issue yet on Ethereum and users are kind of bleeding to these other things because it's a bull market. We have a lot of new people coming in. They don't care about this stuff, right? Um, but I don't think that's a good argument to say that users don't care, so we shouldn't care about decentralization. It is on us as the early pioneers and builders and educators to kind of make sure that people know what they're getting into. I, I, I feel a deep responsibility to that and to do that. And that's why I'm always kind of like, educating. I mean, I do a video every day. I do my newsletter every day. I try to educate on Twitter um, because I, I just feel a responsibility there as well. So there's that aspect to it. Um, and I want to see Ethereum win because um, you might be thinking to me, to yourself, okay, well, you only talk about Ethereum. You don't talk about other chains. Like there's P Cosmos and Polkadot and a bunch of other chains, right? For me, I want to see Ethereum win and like retain like most of the market share because it's it's the most credibly neutral and decentralized blockchain that we have today besides Bitcoin. And obviously, as I said before, you can't kind of do what you can do on Ethereum on Bitcoin. Now for these other networks to reach the level of decentralization and credible neutrality that Ethereum has, it's gonna be extremely difficult. They have different architectures that kind of sacrifice decentralization a bit to achieve greater scale. Yes, even Polkadot does this, right? Which is seems to be everyone's kind of favorite um, outside of like Ethereum, I, I've noticed, you know, a lot of the other chains do this and I haven't seen something that kind of like, I mean, you know, I think the Cosmos ecosystem is probably the closest to how Ethereum's kind of building out right now in terms of like having these bridges between these different kind of layer twos and stuff like that. And, and, but I think Cosmos is still like a delegated proof of stake model, or at least a model where they kind of like have centralization of validators. I haven't looked too deep into it. I've been meaning to. But outside of that, I, ha I can't really see any other projects that kind of speak to me in the same way Ethereum does. So that's why I'm so focused on Ethereum. And also it's a time thing. I mean, like there's so much happening, you know, I cover it every day and with the video and the newsletter and spend all day every day looking at this stuff and I still can't keep up. So, you know, I'm having the most fun in Ethereum too. And it's just like, I'm not going to go to another network and try and kind of like keep up with that. I'm sure there's stuff happening, but like, it'd just be too hard, right? At the end of the day. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I know I've gone a lot, a lot, uh, gone a lot, uh, gone on a lot here about all of this, but I just think it's very, very important to understand all of these trade-offs and to understand kind of like why I was upset. It wasn't about like me feeling threatened by Binance Smart Chain or anything like that. It was me just looking and watching all this misleading marketing going on and people just falling for it and feeling really bad about it. And I was just like, I need to say something. I need to kind of put this signal out there that. This is what this is, you know, just be aware of it, right? You can go play in it. I'm, I totally understand if you want to do that. Um, but, you know, as it exists, it's a centralized kind of platform. And in saying that long term, I believe decentralization wins. But as I said, it takes a lot longer for decentralization to build out than it does centralization because of the various trade-offs. It's just slower moving, right? At the end of the day.
So yeah, overall, isn't me trying to be a kind of like if maxi or coping or whatever. I think whenever someone says that to me, it's like a cop out. It's like, well, that's just like actually debate the points that I'm talking about. Don't just say I'm coping or whatever because I I'm not right. Um, you know, I do get upset about these things, but I don't get upset about watching like another chain kind of get market share. I guess I get upset about the misleading marketing that that first. And and, and you know, I'm being generous by calling it misleading marketing. To me, it's pretty much scamming people because you're just direct, you're just straight up lying to them by saying that it's decentralized um, when you know yourself that it's centralized. Like I, you know, CZ knows this. He's not he's not stupid. He's actually pretty smart. Um, and he's been able to grow his exchange, you know, pretty large. So I can't just say he's he's an idiot or whatever, but I just think that he is, it's just pretty gross, right? I just don't like that. And it's not something that I'm within these, within the ecosystem for, and I don't want to stand by and just watch it kind of play out as well. So yeah, I guess end rant there. I just, uh, I think it's very, very important to keep this top of mind as we progress through this bull market. There's going to be a lot of noise, a lot of new people coming in. It's on us to educate them and just let them know that what they're playing with is not equivalent to Ethereum. It is not the same thing. Um, and what we have in Ethereum is different and what we're building is different. And I think Banteg had a really great tweet here about, you know, describe Ethereum's values, how many brave builders it has brought into the world, how many people it has enamored, now, t try to describe BSE's values, right? And there's nothing there, right? It's it's it, 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 For me, it is all about the values, the spirit, the soul of Ethereum. And that might sound a little bit cringy to, to, to you for me to say, but I don't care. Like, this is what I believe in. And like, I'm not gonna uh, sacrifice my beliefs just for some short-term gain, um, you know, whether that be monetary or kind of user experience. I believe that Ethereum will scale. I believe that it will fix all our problems, but we will stay true to decentralization to do so. And we will not kind of compromise on that as one of our core values. So yeah. End rant officially there. Let's talk a bit more about some uh, some more positive things, I think. Actually, I think this tweet from Matthew Feinstone is about scalability. So let's talk about Ethereum scalability here. So the layer two ecosystem on Ethereum is obviously being built out right now. It is still kind of, I guess, like small, but quickly, quickly evolving here. And there's a few different ways you can onboard. One of the ways is that you can go from layer one directly to, uh, I guess, say Loopring, for example, but that's unfortunately costly because you still have to spend uh, spend uh, the layer one fee, right? Spend a fee on, on layer one to do this. Um, and then there's other ways that haven't been implemented yet, like batched onboarding, where you can actually pull capital together in a trustless way on, on layer one. So only one fee has to be paid for potentially 1000 users moving into layer two, right? So that'll come, but it hasn't been implemented yet in a big way. The, the third thing is uh, on ramps, uh, direct fiat on ramps into these layer twos, which I think Loopring's working on, but hasn't been put out yet. So as I said, this is still very early. And then the biggest way to get, or at least the fastest way to get people onto layer two is through centralized exchange and service on ramps. So you could imagine say Coinbase, right? having an on-ramp from their centralized exchange to a loop rings layer two, right? So you could say, when you go to withdraw ETH, for example, on Coinbase, it'll have a drop-down menu and it'll say, withdraw to Ethereum mainnet or withdraw to loop ring or, or, or some other solutions as well. And then you could have like a little explanation there of what it is and say, you know, loop ring is a layer two solution on Ethereum. It gives you cheaper and faster transactions, right? Uh, and you can do this, this, and this with it. It doesn't take much to educate these users, right? And the reason why this is so powerful coming from a centralized exchange is because they are the front door. They are the port of entry for new people. And new people are the ones who are gonna have the worst experience because imagine a new person comes into Ethereum today. They buy ETH, they buy tokens, they withdraw it to their wallet. And then they go to Uniswap and they hit with a $50 transaction fee for a trade. And all the stuff that they've been hearing about Ethereum and DeFi crashes, right? All the good stuff, all the positive stuff, right? About the future of finance, doing these things crashes because they're like, why? Like, this is crazy. $50 fees is insane. And to be fair, they're not wrong, right? It, it is insane. I, I'm not defending the high fees as something that is uh, a good thing for end users, right? I have argued before about how high, high gas fees are good in the short term for the entire ecosystem um, for, for a variety of reasons. But for end users, their first experience shouldn't be a $50 Uniswap trade. So instead, if we get them onto like Looperings layer two, they can spend, a, I think it's like two cents to do a trade on there, right? And get the same experience as they would get on Uniswap. Um, and then that's their first experience into Ethereum. So I think that's incredibly important. And I think exchanges should do this. Like if you, if you know someone or work in an exchange or like, 
you know, if you're just a customer, send a, a kind of message to them and, and say, please integrate layer two solutions, right? It is not very difficult to do. And it just requires the attention of these um, centralized exchanges to do so. And it saves them money as well because they're paying transaction fees for users to go you know, out. I mean, and they're also sometimes putting the transaction fees on users to withdraw from, from their exchange, which is also a bad experience too. So yeah, I think, um, you know, Matt tweeted out a bit to, to like Gemini, Coinbase and Kraken to get these kind of um, onboarded. And all you have to do is use this API call within uh, Loopring ZK rollup uh, kind of documentation here. And it's that easy, right? So I think this is this is how we kind of beat the, I guess the Binance smart chains of the world and how we beat off the competition is that we basically get these centralized players to uh, integrate layer two. And to be fair, some of them have already experimented with this. Coinbase integrated uh, Optimism's testnet on their Coinbase mobile wallet app. But as obviously as it's a testnet and there's not many apps available yet, there's not much going on there. But I think Coinbase, given that I think they're an investor in Optimism, but they've already done integration with Optimism, when that Optimism goes live in an, in, a, in, a, in an actual capacity outside of like a guarded launch, like in a full mainnet capacity, I can see Coinbase adopting that, which I think is really cool. But they need to adopt more than just one. They need to do like a handful of them, of the biggest ones, to make sure the users have a choice and, you know, users can can basically uh, choose where they want to go. Because the end state for Ethereum is that most users will live on these layer two solutions rather than the Ethereum mainnet because we want to preserve that decentralization. And the only way to do that is to push people to layer two because layer one has to be, you know, be incredibly neutral and it will always be limited because of that, uh, which means that the gas fees will potentially always be high but we, we it can fix that with layer two solutions. So that's what I'm betting on, of course, and that's what a lot of the people in the ecosystem are betting on, but we need these centralized exchanges to help us out here, I think. So I spoke about Ether cards the other day. So just, I wanted to give another quick shout out here that their sale details are now live. So I'll link this in the YouTube description and you can go check out how the sale is gonna be run, all the details about it, how you can get your hands on some and everything like that. So yeah, definitely um, go check this out. I mean, I talked about it the other day. Basically, this is a kind of a new trading card game or, or at least a, a trading card collectible game on Ethereum where you can buy a bunch of different cards and they have like different traits and things like that, which give you kind of bonuses across the ecosystem and stuff like that. So yeah, definitely go check this out if that was something you were interested in the other day that I was talking about it. So Alchemix is an upcoming DeFi protocol that's been teased for quite a while now. And they put out a blog post today called a prologue. This is a little bit of a kind of mission statement, I think. Uh, and then they kind of like tease that it's coming soon. So I think they're gonna be officially announcing very, very soon. So if you don't know or haven't been paying attention to this project, I definitely go suggest giving them a follow here on Twitter so that you don't miss the announcement. They call themselves DeFi Alchemical Synthetic Tokens. So yeah, looks like they're doing something very interesting here and they're gearing up for an announcement. Uh, but their prologue was pretty cool. You know, they basically give, gave their, their mission statement here and what they're kind of like trying to fix with these systems, but very short teaser, but I, I figured I'd just bring it to, to your attention anyway, so you could go check this out when you've got some time. So Andre put out a, a new tweet today, basically saying that you can now do uh, $200,000 synthetic atomic swaps between SBTC, SETH, and SUSD. Uh, so this is really cool. I mean, this is the cross asset swaps, uh, sorry, the synthetics atomic swaps that have been teased for quite a while here. So basically what you can do is you can see on the on the contract here with, with Yearn, you can go from like SBTC to SUSD in a, in a really big way, like $200,000 swap. So really, really, uh, you know, deep kind of liquidity here uh, with uh, huge trade sizes. So obviously a lot of us don't do trade sizes like this. This is, this is kind of whale territory, but whales are the ones who bring a lot of liquidity here. So giving them more options to do these larger trades is very positive, I think, for the overall ecosystem here. So yeah, really cool from Andre here. And I guess you can look up the, the transaction on Etherscan and see what's kind of going on here. I was linked to the contract. So yeah, if you're a developer, you can go read this contract. I mean, I'm not, and I, you know, I read this and I'm like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, those are some words there. <laughs> so yeah, if you're a dev, get definitely go check out the contract there. So Block Native have updated their uh, Mempool Explorer. Um, they've refreshed it. You can now uh, watch your your wallet, the top stable coins, and the top dexes on there. Now I think there's a link to this somewhere. If I go to their website here, I might be able to find the link because I've I've spoken about the Mempool Explorer before, and about how it lets you basically, uh, you know, 
look into the mempool and kind of like get a view of it. Uh, because right now with block explorers, you basically look into what's already happened on the blockchain, whereas the mempool is what potentially is going to happen. So that's where all transactions go, or at least all pending transactions go uh, before you before they're included in a block. And not, they're not always included in a block. Some of them fail, right? Some of them are reversed, some of them are canceled, things like that. So yeah, you can basically, I think uh, if I go here, I can go to their Explorer uh, and, find, and, and kind of like show you what it looks like here. Cause it's actually pretty cool. I've played around with it before. If it's gonna load up here. Uh, it's taking a bit long to load, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess like I can talk to a bit more about what this is. So as I said, it lets you explore the transactions that are in the mempool waiting to be included in a block. And this kind of like helps people and helps different teams with like looking into kind of activity of users and, you know, bot activity, MEV activity, front running, all the stuff that I've spoken about before on the refuel, it kind of lets you do that. Um, so yeah, here we go. If we go for a live example, click here to connect and monitor your own wallet address. I don't want to do that right now. I want to do kind of this. So this is monitoring kind of like the stablecoin transactions within the mempool. So you can see here, I mean, this probably doesn't mean much to you and it's scrolling by pretty fast, but this is basically JSON data. And this data can be passed into like any kind of application that you want to kind of uh, track what's happening here uh, and kind of like see what was included, what wasn't included in, in, in a block and you know, was it a front run transaction? Was it not? Um, so yeah, really, really cool tool here from Block Native, and definitely go check it out if you haven't already. All right, so last thing I wanted to talk about here was that um, Christie's Auction House, a very, very big auction house uh, for art, is uh, accepting ETH as a uh, payment for, for this kind of Beeple auction that they're doing. And I kind of tweeted out here that ETH is money uh, because they're accepting it, which I thought was really, really cool. Um, I thought, you know, in particularly, in particular, it's cool to see, you know, ETH is, ETH is money coming alive in general, right? I mean, I, I mentioned the other day how a lot of the NFT economy right now is priced in ETH. Uh, a lot of it runs on ETH. You know, it, it basically exposes people to holding ETH and using it as money, using it as kind of a store of value, sort of things like that. So really positive to see Christie's here, which is not like a crypto company, right? They're a very kind of like outside of crypto company, accepting kind of crypto here and accepting ETH specifically uh, for this artwork. And I think this is actually going to go for a lot, this artwork. What it is, it's basically uh, 5,000 of Beeple's pieces. Um, like here, you can see it on the picture here. So uh, well, there's the paywall. You can't see it anymore, but basically you can see it in the thumbnail here. Um, and basically, uh, I think this is going to be quite a large auction. I'd be surprised if it, if it goes for less than a million, right? You know, it's probably going to go for a few million because Beeple is very, very large and famous. He has uh, 200,000 followers almost on Twitter, over a million followers on Instagram, and he basically creates uh, 3D art pieces every day. And he's been doing that for the last 13 years, like every day. So there's a lot of hype behind him. He's already done a few sales. He's made a few million dollars off of his art um, through the NFT space. So this is just another one here. And the fact that Christie's is accepting ETH is really cool because obviously you can accept ETH if you're doing the sales on Ethereum, right? But this sale is being done through this traditional auction house. So good to see ETH being used as money, uh, you know, even outside of the Ethereum ecosystem here. All right, everyone, that's it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching and listening. Subscribe to that YouTube channel if you haven't yet. Give the video a thumbs up. Join the Daily Grade Discord channel. Uh, subscribe to the Daily Grade newsletter, and I will catch you all next week. Thanks, everyone.